everyone. Welcome back. Welcome back from that short break. In case you're just joining us, I'm Rachel Baker, the Forest Program Director for Washington Conservation Action. Our next presentation is Microsoft Campus Modernization, a case study on timber preservation and use. A few quick logistical reminders. If you run into any issues during the session or have questions, please email Tina at the address pinned in the chat box on the right of the webinar screen. You can use that same chat box to set chat box to send messages, but keep in mind that any messages will be visible to all attendees. If you'd like to submit any questions to the speakers, uh, please use the Q&A feature, which you can access in your toolbar at the bottom of your webinar screen. So we'll sort through all those questions and present them to the speakers at the end of the presentation. And the more questions, the merrier. Um, this presentation is being recorded, as you may have noticed, and it will be shared with participants uh, after the conference concludes. So in today's presentation, we're excited to highlight a specific construction project with a focus on sustainability, a Microsoft campus modernization project um, in Redmond, Washington. Owners and developers like Microsoft are increasingly pursuing green building with a lower carbon footprint, matching their own commitments and values. In this space, there's a growing recognition that specific wood products selected for construction product or projects matter a great deal, not only with regards to structural qualities like strength or aesthetic qualities like appearance, but also in terms of carbon impacts, social and ecological values they promote at the forest of origin, and matching the, the values and narrative that the, the builder developer is seeking to tell. Although challenges may arise in data, transparency, and procurement of responsibly sourced wood products, those barriers can be overcome through collaboration between uh, owners, developers, and the architecture, engineering, and construction sector, as well as wood suppliers. So this Microsoft Campus Modernization Study project demonstrates the array of real-life considerations that arise related to building projects in wood, including embodied carbon of wood products in buildings and the management of trees and forested stands on site. So we'll learn how Microsoft and uh, architecture, planning, and construction sector partners use multiple strategies to promote sustainable wood procurement and use. And hopefully this can provide us all with some insights and good practices that are transferable to other projects. So with that, I'm pleased to introduce our panel of speakers. Maggie Goodman is an interior designer, global workplace design strategist and lead accredited professional who is passionate about creating built environments that fundamentally enhance human experience through thoughtful, purposeful driven design. She works with a diverse group of designers, project managers, uh, contractors and stakeholders to empower teams to design innovative, accessible, sustainable, and inclusive workspaces. As one of the global workplace strategists at Microsoft, Maggie leads design and programming on a wide range of project types, scale, and complexity, ranging from interiors and new construction projects to outdoor environments and amenity spaces. Recent projects include the Microsoft Campus Modernization Project in Redmond, Washington, where Maggie led the design process for five new buildings. She was also responsible for leading the on-site tree salvage and reuse efforts across the project. Uh, next, we have Kira Burns, who's a driver of sustainability and project execution for large corporations like Microsoft and Boeing. Uh, in her current role as development manager at Microsoft, she ran the planning, design, and construction of the redevelopment of 76 acres and 3 million square feet of new construction at their corporate headquarters in Redmond, Washington. In this multi-year project, Kira was the execution focal point for the project sustainability goals, such as ILFI zero carbon certification and a 30% reduction in embodied carbon. Uh, Pauline Souza is the WRNS Studios Director of Sustainability and lead of the K-12 and Community Studio. Pauline has led award-winning and community-focused projects like Sacred Heart Schools, Net Zero Stevens Library, and the Atherton Library and Civic Center, which recently won a PEC All Electric Award and AIA ALA 2023 Library Award. She helped co author uh, key chapters in the Decarbonization Building Practice Guide and led the Sonoma Academy Guild and Commons, uh, earning the 2018 AIA uh, COTE Top 10 Green Project Award, the highest honor for sustainable design in the industry. Uh, and then we have Angie Rivera with experience leading government and commercial teams globally through the strategic sustainability planning and sustainable design and construction processes. Angie joined Selen, one of the largest locally owned general contractors in the Pacific Northwest in 2021. As Selen's sustainability director, Angie oversees the company's strategic sustainability direction and enables Selen to deliver spaces that meet or exceed client sustainability goals from strategy development to sustainability certifications to operational carbon emissions, to embodied carbon analysis. 
so pleased to have you all here on this all woman panel. Um, and I'm happy to turn it over to you all to share more about the project. Thanks so much. And we're excited to be here too. Um, so as she mentioned, I am Kira Bruns and I'm with Microsoft and I'll be sharing a little bit today along with Maggie and Pauline and Angie about campus modernization. I've been working on this project for about six years, so I know way too many fun facts and we're excited to talk a little bit more in detail about uh, timber preservation and what we did on this project to salvage trees. So to give you a kind of full picture of what, you know, drives Microsoft and our goals, we started this project and the planning for it years ago. So in 2017, when we were bringing the project teams together, we started looking at, we knew that sustainability was going to be an important piece of this project. And we started bringing our teams together and having design charrettes and sustainability charrettes. And it was really exciting because we got to combine like experts. We had such a large team that we could use experts from wherever. And then in 2020, our corporate leadership kind of could see that what we were doing is what we wanted to do as a company. So they made it public that we made our 2030 goals in 2020. So Microsoft decided that we would be carbon negative by 2030, so we're gonna reduce emissions by 15% and then offset what we admit. Um, we're gonna focus on protecting more land than we operate by 2030. And so that means a lot of different things, but um, protecting the land we have, looking at what options we have to do with our built environment and zero waste by 2030. So diverting 90% of the waste from the landfill and water positive by 2030. We've been working really hard, this project in particular, to meet these goals and make sure that our goals for the project align with this. And we did use like some rain water reuse and generally from our organization perspective, we kind of try and focus on what is region specific. So I'll talk a little bit more about the project and what we chose here versus, you know, maybe in a project in India, we might be more worried about water stress. Um, so this is camper, campus modernization. Here's a photo of the project recently. It's pretty exciting to see so many buildings up there and complete. Um, the overall project consists of 17 buildings, including the Thermal Energy Center, and it's projected to have 12,000 seats. Right now, we've built eight of those buildings, and they've been being occupied from August through the end of this year. They predominantly are about five story buildings and have the first floor is like a amenity space, like dining, retail, things like that. We really wanted to create an urban feel for our campus and then office space for the top four floors with the exception of the Thermal Energy Center, which is our uh, central utility plant that we use to heat and cool the campus. It really is the heart of the campus. Um, so when you talk about tree preservation, you don't always think about like, how are you heating and cooling your building and what that means, but we have a 72 acre campus, but we had to drill 900 geo wells for our, um, for our central utility plant to support the heating and cooling of all these 17 buildings. And so it's like a constant balance of figuring out yeah, okay, you have this giant 72 acre campus and there should be plenty of room to save all these trees and not have to cut anything down. But the, it wasn't quite that simple. Like if you look at the photo here, you can tell that the, the site's actually quite congested, you know, between the footprints of the buildings. And then we also have a large, very large underground parking garage here that can't really be seen that most of these buildings sit on top of that holds about 6,500 vehicles. And then you add in sports fields and geo wells, and you find very little space for tree preservation. So we did have to work very, very hard as a team to work together to preserve trees where we could. Um, this project's pursuing lead platinum, ILFI zero carbon certification, and salmon safe. So some of the project sustainability goals, 
I kind of broke these into like focused on what are Microsoft sustainability goals. And then these are like a little step deeper of what the project sustainability goals. So ILFI zero carbon certification, we've been working with EC3 to uh, pilot it, the tool and now it's out there and people can use it to measure and body carbon. And we've been able to reduce, you know, our A1 through A3 emissions by 50% and our overall body carbon by 30%. And the way that we've been able to obtain ILFI zero, zero carbon certification is that we have a purchasing plan for power. And so we've purchased all sustainable power to support the project. Um, and I think another thing that was really interesting with the carbon here is that like we had to learn how to operate a zero carbon campus, which might sound simple, but when you're talking to a chef who's used to cooking on a gas grill and you're telling him that he needs to cook all electric or we have to design a walk for them to cook on, they might be like, oh, okay, what, what is this? This is like a whole new experience. So I think with every step of sustainability, if it's tree preservation, if it's salvage, if it's electric cooking, like anything that the industry isn't used to, somebody has to be a leader. And so we really, when we talked about the sustainability goals for this project, we wanted to make sure that we did something that helped progress the industry. Um, bike parking PV, water, we harvested some rainwater to, or from off our roofs to flush our fixtures. That was a new thing. And we had to work with City of Redmond to get all the code to align because there's a lot of challenging logistics between like, having water that's come off the roof into the toilets and using for in the space. Uh, our goal for waste was to divert 90% of the waste from the construction and we were actually able to obtain 92%, which was exciting. And probably what you're most interested in is, is the ecosystems, uh, salmon safe certification. We provided uh, vegetated roofs for 5% of our roofs and then we also have a lot of focus on preserving salvage and replanting trees. So for, for preservation, we did things like looking at the positioning of buildings to see if there was like legacy trees that we could save. We, um, Maggie will be going into extensive detail about salvage and we did replant one for one for what we cut down. And then um, another piece that was uh, important to us is to obtain 50% FSC wood, which we were successful at, and anything that wasn't FSC to try and obtain locally sourced wood. So that means manufactured, harvested within 500 miles. So I'm gonna let Maggie talk a little bit more about our tree preservation. Salvage. Thanks, Kira. Thank you. Uh, so here we've got a, a photo of the site before construction. Um, this part of the campus, it's part of 72 acres, as Kira mentioned before. Um, and the part that we're looking at here with these star-shaped buildings um, is sort of the oldest part of our Microsoft campus. So it carries a lot of history and heritage and culture along with it, aside from um, you know, just being part of the campus, Microsoft has its roots in the Pacific Northwest and it's a big part of our culture. And this portion of the site was also, I would say, had the highest quantity and density of tree planting anywhere on the site. So it was really important for us to think about, you know, how are we gonna approach the, you know, the site, the design, the demo, the construction in a uh, responsible way when we think about you know, preservation and what that means um, for this site, what it means for our sustainability goals and what it means to kind of represent the culture of Microsoft and that Pacific Northwest history as a company. Um, so we found that there were sort of three key areas where we could have an impact. So the first was with preserving and protecting, um, then salvage and reuse, and finally our replanting strategy. So um, Kira briefly mentioned this, but I think the first step in this preserving and protecting was really, you know, kind of site analysis and then, you know, thinking about how we locate our buildings on the site itself. 
So we did have a lot of challenges, as she mentioned, in terms of, you know, uh, some of the things we were trying to add, and including the underground garage and the geothermal wells. Um, but I think the mindset that we brought to this and what we asked all of our project partners to do was to really take this lens of preservation as a goal and help us to achieve that. So um, kind of starting with site analysis, right? It's working with our architects, landscape architects, um, construction teams to, to you know, evaluate what do we actually have on site in terms of the species of trees, the diameter, are these legacy trees, what type of trees, are they healthy, can they sustain, um, you know, through construction. And then the architects helping us understand how we can place the buildings into the landscape in a way that respects the natural environment. And I think what you see here on the image on the right is a really good example of that, where uh, this is building one, uh, which is still under construction, but it shows how it's, you know, very, very much nestled into the landscape, this part of the campus that does have a higher density of trees and really represents that Pacific Northwest ethos when you're in the building, which is exciting for our employees and visitors to see, because again, it is really part of the Microsoft roots as a Pacific Northwest company. And then with the construction um, protection portion of it, you know, really having to figure out with our construction teams, how we can um, organize the construction logistics, the haul roads, phasing in order to keep the trees safe during construction. So after we sort of figured out how we could maximize tree preservation, you know, we still found ourselves with a lot of trees that we're going to have to come down and we wanted to do more. And so, you know, the question came up, well, what can we, what can we do? Could we salvage these trees? Can we use them to create, you know, furniture or, you know, design features inside of our buildings? What would that look like? And what does that take? Um, at Microsoft and the real estate teams, this was not something we had done before. So we had to kind of, start at ground zero and figure it out. <laughs> so um, I spent a lot of time doing research and understanding which project partners in the region would have the right expertise to help us with this, you know, and what that really looks like um, from a process perspective. Um, we ultimately partnered with Urban Hardwoods, who's now known as Urban Lumber, and they helped really walk us through this process of, you know, this vision of what we thought we could create and helping us achieve that by, you know, going through tree identification, um, create a milling and drying plan, um, which we had to create before we actually had done the design. Um, due to the timing of how all these puzzle pieces were coming together, you know, the wood was going to have to dry for several years, but the design hadn't happened yet. So we had to kind of get ahead of ourselves a little bit and come up with a milling plan that would give us the most flexibility, um, you know, a year down the road when we actually started to design, um, you know, whether that's the furniture or the wall cladding, the different pieces that we integrated into the project. Um, so we have some photos here from the milling. We, we did ultimately, this is a, you know, certainly a multi-year project, um, the drying time, for most of the wood, the air drying time was about two years, and then it was followed by a kiln drying cycle. And if you move to the next slide, some images of the wood um, as it's being stored. We were also, you know, kind of tracking the chain of custody really closely. We weren't really sure how this might show up in any of our kind of sustainability metrics or how we would think about it. Um, but we wanted to kind of know what species came from where, what parts of the campus, again, as part of that heritage and kind of storytelling aspect for the history of Microsoft. Um, what you can see here is ultimately the, the milling plan that we kind of landed on was, you know, milling everything about two inches thick with live edges on both sides that would give us a lot of flexibility to make, you know, furniture or any other number of items. Um, there were a few other pe pieces that had been sort of designed ahead of time that we could mill to specifically. Um, but this is basically what it looked like for about two years until we got to the design phase. And again, this is where we came to our project partners and said, hey, you know, we've identified how much salvage wood we have, and we had a list of board footage and the, you know, how much board footage we had of each different type of species. 
we shared that with our architects and designers and asked them to bring their creativity to help us achieve this vision um, where we wanted to have, you know, every building to have some salvage wood features. Um, and we wanted there to be a good variety. We didn't want there to be the same one in every building. So um, it was a pretty exciting time for us. And I think our project partners were also really excited to work with the salvage wood. And so here on the screen, you see some of the finished results that we have. Um, and this is just a small sampling because we were fortunate to be able to make a lot of design features out of the wood. Um, so building entry door pulls, reception desks, cafe tables, occasional tables, uh, atrium design features like you see on the right. We have wall cladding as well as an outdoor sculpture that's yet to be um, unveiled. I've got my camera here. I'll try and fix that. Um, and then we created a small tag that we've added to all of the features to help identify which pieces were made from salvage wood on site. So again, that's another way we can connect with the employees and connect that history of our campus. And I think that's it for salvage wood. Uh, so then on to replanting. Um, knowing again, we've done as much as we can with tree preservation and then also with salvage wood and reuse. Um, the next was sort of our, was our replanting strategy. So the baseline for our replanting strategy was to meet the city of Redmond requirements, which we knew we would have to do. We were able to go beyond those requirements, which is pretty exciting. And you could see a photo here of recent installation um, on the new campus. And the focus of the replanting was with native and adaptive species, um, which was important to us for a number of reasons, but I think it, it contributes to our outdoor water use reduction credit and also for salmon certification goal. Um, and again, we, we wanted to be representative of the Northwest and, and, and um, what can flourish and thrive here best. So with that, I will pass it off to Angie. Great, thanks Maggie. Hello everybody. Um, I think it's important uh, to acknowledge for uh, projects, you know, especially of this size, but of any size that, you know, even projects with the best of planning and intentions, um, sourcing and procurement challenges always come up. Um, they're very commonplace um, and that is, quite often the case for wood-based products. Um, and the campus modernization was no different. During the construction, we you know, not only ran into the, the standard um, sourcing issues of just avail general availability um, and you know, just supply and demand, but you know, COVID was during that and we had unprecedented wildfires as well. So the, the supply chain was very, um, unpredictable um, and it, this it did impact um, availability and cost. So, you know, it's um, it's very important when you run into these issues for, you know, wood materials, but also just anything um, sustainability wise on a project that, you know, achieving a sustainable result, it's, it's not all or nothing. It's important to remain flexible, you know, you bob and you weave. Um, and it was, you know, refreshing that at, uh, Microsoft, the team was engaged and uh, we developed a um, informed decision-making process. And so that way the entire team could come around the table whenever an issue came up and make an informed decision. This was um, very beneficial for us and it provided flexibility without you know, compromising responsibility. Um, we looked at the wood-based product sourcing um, holistically. So you know, as uh, Maggie and Kira already spoke about, but we looked at it from both FSC and local, regional and salvaged. And so it wasn't just FSC or nothing. Um, and because of this, we were able to achieve 76% um, sustainably sourced wood products. And this doesn't include the value that, you know, we could have uh, accounted for with the site salvaged materials. Next slide. These are just some of the examples of how the wood, the sustainable wood products were implemented um, on the site. Um, 
salvage wood surfaces in work and eating spaces, reception furniture, um, also FSC um, acoustic walls and ceilings, and then local regional um, millwork. I think it, it was incredibly successful, this mill work on the, on the right, um, because it, it's a really success story of how that decision-making process was pulled in to help the overall sustainability of the project, because this mill work actually was FSC um, to, a, to a certain point in the, in the um, chain of custody. And then because FSC in the chain of custody, the way that the rules work, it must be FSC throughout um, to be labeled that when it arrives on site. However, all of the wood was also sourced within 500 miles and this mill work was manufactured within 500 miles. So not only was it sustainably sourced, but it was also manufactured locally, regionally, which supports the local regional economy, which is really great. And <clears throat> Unfortunately, um, you know, it's it's not uncommon <laughs> uh, run into this this issue of of having um this chain of custody broken. Um, but because we were able to incorporate the flexibility, um we were able to source it. We didn't have any um, you know, it didn't impact our schedule and the the cost was not in you know inflated unnecessarily. Um, and I think I'm passing on to Pauline. Um, <laughs> Thank you, Evan. Pauline. Evan? <laughs> I'm coming for her. Um, unfortunately, she couldn't be here, but she's in Japan and couldn't figure out, couldn't connect via Zoom. So I'm Evan Ponto. Um, I'm with OAC Services, and I've been on the project for the past five years. Um, as a sustainability project manager. So this is very familiar to me. So diving in a little bit close to kind of what Maggie was talking about, one of the key kind of design focuses for the project was kind of living within the folk, within the forest. And so this is these are two specific buildings um, out of the 17, and these were designed by WRNS. And so the buildings on this part of campus, they were designed specifically to be within the forest while really limiting the amount of impact to trees. And so the angle of the building, for example, was chosen to reduce impact and also bring the building a lot closer to that existing forest thread. Um, this section of the campus had some of the oldest and largest conifers on the campus. And so we tried to preserve as many as we possibly could and the building design um, was really important to that. And so another kind of a lot of benefits been found in kind of the ecology of the canopy of the forest. And so the design of this building, um, really the design was to bring people as close to the canopy as possible and allow em employees um, to really feel like they're a part of the forest and surrounded by the forest. And so that is really key. And there's also kind of, this is a mass timber building. And so there's a Warren truss that supports two full levels of that's visible um, at the floors and ceilings. And so it's, a vis vi it's visible as you approach the building and also while you're in the building. So in the bottom right photo here, you can kind of see the reflection. So there's kind of wood from below. There's wood that you can see visible in the building while you're there. And you can also see all the trees that were preserved and are around it. Another, so mass timber was used throughout these buildings and it's really a great way to accomplish kind of bringing nature within the buildings. And so there was a big design focus on kind of expressing innovation and craft. Um, there is a lot of craft behind mass timber. I think its use in buildings is kind of more and more pre prevalent fairly recently. And so there's a lot of kind of innovative design that comes around kind of bringing nature in and bringing wood um, into the spaces and into the building as the, the key structural system. And so here there's a, kind of a lot of challenges with the mass timber. Um, the floor is also the ceiling since kind of it's all mass timber around. And so you must figure out kind of how to heat, how to cool and how to control acoustics. And so in this building, the, there is radiant floor heating um, on both floors. And so the building kind of the design team had to figure out kind of how to do all of this outside of the typical structural systems with steel or concrete. And so it creates some challenges, but also allows for a lot of innovation um, with, within the design of these spaces. 
So lastly, for these projects, I just wanted to touch on kind of embodied carbon analysis at a really high level. And so you can see over the left here, kind of some structural and architectural, the, the impacts of overall embodied carbon. So the structural aspects is really, really huge. And you can see that wood is considered, can, can be considered a carbon negative material. And so we're showing a minus 8% for embodied carbon due to all the carbon that's trapped in the material. And so really it, it, it allowed us and helped us to meet our um, overall carbon goals and meet our zero carbon certification. So I think we're doing okay on time. I think we've got a couple more minutes. So one other project we just wanted to touch upon really quick is um, the Silicon Valley campus, which is another Microsoft campus down in Silicon Valley in California. And so we just wanted to talk really briefly about some of the kind of the solutions that we were deploying at this campus. And as Kira kind of highlighted in the very beginning of the presentation, it like the Microsoft goals for each project are curated towards the region. And so this region, a, a big focus that we won't talk about today was water and also green roof. So you can see from the top of this picture, like the entire campus here um, is pretty much vegetated and focusing green roof. And so when design was started, it was they it was really envisioned a place that would truly embrace the local habitat as part of the built environment. And they wanted to recreate a place for employees to collaborate, support the local community and enhance and protect the environment. And so regionally relevant solutions were leveraged here um, and basically focused on health and well-being of employees um, in the local si system. And so solving both sides of the equation here, um, basically you have embodied carbon and you have operational carbon. And so there's this was also a zero carbon building and there's just kind of both aspects. You want to reduce the operational carbon as much as possible by providing fully renewable energy and basically providing as much energy efficiency and decreasing your EUI as much as possible using on-site generation and thermal storage, similar to the Thermal Energy Center, which is used on Campus Mod. And then you also want to decrease the embodied carbon of your building. And so using FSC certified mass timber here for the two-story structure was the way that they achieved this. And so a third of the overall floor area was actually reused from a re-existing re building and then primarily uses or regular structural system and grid, but here they used um, CLT as the mass timber structure. And that is all that we have today. So thank you very much and wanted to kind of go into any questions that we received. Thank you so much. Um, and thanks, Evan, for seamlessly jumping in. Um, if you can take down that presentation when you've got a moment, we can see everyone's faces all at once. That feels. Um, that was a great presentation. Uh, I'm really grateful that you all were willing to share more about that real life project with us. So some of the concepts we talk about feel more tangible. And it, it really stands out to me the amount of thought and effort that went into so many different facets of the project, how many pieces there are to balance, thinking about carbon, aesthetics, local sourcing, regional character, certification of wood, uh, including details that would never occur to me, like the challenges of shifting to zero carbon for a chef who's accustomed to certain tools of the trade. Uh, so I'm sure the audience will have plenty of questions that hopefully will keep on rolling in, um, but I'll start us off with a few. Um, if I'm not mistaken, you mentioned the project is still under construction and not complete. Is that right? Um, so can someone speak to when it will be complete and um, will the general public or interested stakeholders be able to visit and learn about the project? Yes. Um, so we don't have an exact date for all the buildings to be complete. You know, when you do a master plan and you have 17 buildings, it really, we have to look at what we're needed in our area and our, and what, uh, you know, like the seat count we need and what's going on on campus. And, you know, we're constantly evaluating that. So we really have seen that the first seven buildings, well, eight including the tech that have been occupied. We have three that are occupying in the next month. There's been a lot of energy and the intent of this project was to create like an urban feel in our Microsoft campus. And we've seen that already. So if you're, I mean, 
we're doing sustainability signage on the site that's like a self-guided tour that people can come out and check out. You can go walk on the porch of the tech. And so we probably will be sharing more publicly some of these things. Maybe, you know, we're still doing a lot of site work now too. Like even if we have certain buildings turning over, we it was phased in, in pieces so that it felt, you know, had an urban feel went open and was condensed and wasn't just like, oh, we're opening one building on the south side of the campus. And then, you know, 15 minute walk away, we're opening another building. So we tried to open like kind of the front north west corner of it. And there's also a bridge that comes across from West Campus. They'll be opening in the spring and there'll be a light rail station once the light rail starts running in Redmond too shortly. Very exciting. I look forward to seeing it myself um, someday down the road. Um, so as you all know, this conference, this group of people attending is particularly interested in, in wood. And um, I noticed throughout the presentation, you mentioned various factors or considerations that came up with wood salvage on site, some FSC certified, um, sourcing locally, milling and manufacturing locally. Um, I'm curious if if we can dig a little deeper into the, the wood procurement piece. Uh, does Microsoft have a policy on wood procurement or what guides your decision-making process between different sources of wood with different um, ecological and social values? Well, I think we are a global company. And so we really have to look at what that specific region is looking for. I think our focus here in the Pacific Northwest is, you know, we're trying for a goal of 50% FSC in some of our, in our projects, but we're still figuring that out. Like that was established as a goal for this project. And we've learned a lot from that. And it's like, how do you implement that on different scales? Like here we had a very robust procurement process around that because we had so much support, but you know, on a small project, how does that work? And in a different region, you know, maybe the focus is different, you know, like how we talked about in SVC, yes, wood was a focus there too, but the most important thing was water or in Hyderabad, we're focused on the local materials there. And maybe Maggie can talk about how globally we, we look at materials differently too. Yeah, I can add to that. I think we do have sustainability standards in which we do um, specify some things about material um, specifications and procurement and how that aligns to our corporate goals. And those are global standards. Um, however, I think what we find in some regions, especially outside the US, it's harder to come by FSC uh, materials or if they are available, they are coming from Europe. So then you're kind of wondering, is that really sustainable because you're shipping them halfway around the world? And um, you know, especially in Asia. So I think there are other ways that we have to think about it in different regions. And so that sort of plays out on a project specific level rather than in our general standards. But we do have, you know, those um, corporate goals that Kira mentioned, which all of our real estate projects ladder up to. So we will find a way to be tracking towards that and achieve it on every project. Um, and then it might play out slightly differently just depending on the region and the, the scale of the project. Thanks, that, that's helpful. It sounds like there are some kind of company-wide goals and guidance, but then it's really at the project level that the specific uh, framework or criteria emerge. Um, so kind of continue on that topic, uh, I'm curious if you can speak a bit about the social impact and equity criteria that may have been incorporated into decision-making and um, uh, procurement in this project and kind of how you think about balancing those kind of social and equity criteria with more carbon and climate focused considerations. I, I think that it, it was actually very hard to balance all, all these different things like with sustainability is like when you go in and you start doing the sustainability strategy, you want to do everything like you want to do as much as you can to make a difference and then you start to see you're like okay where are our resources and our energy like best focused like what can we do that we feel like we can make an impact you know and we felt like with 50 percent fsc on this wood and trying to locally source that that made the best impact for this area that we could do. And we we really did 
contractors worked with the subs and tried to work with figuring out how to obtain the FSC. I know that there were discussions about trying to figure out how to get places, you know, FSC certification for places. And it wasn't, I mean, just the timing of this project alone was very challenging. So I think it's a constant balance with each project and looking at the market and doing research and trusting our partners. I mean, like Cello worked really hard with their subcontractor. I mean, another thing that like I kind of didn't mention is that we had, you know, multiple GC general contractors on this project. And so we worked together to do like bulk buys and to do different strategies. And so we had such a large buying power that that was like a good thing and a bad thing because for something with FSC when there's there's not an infinite supply of it, right? So we have to we have to figure out where where do we use it, you know, where does it make sense? Or I think that story with the casework is just a really interesting one about how, yeah, we said within 500 miles, but how do you do that? How do you like find somebody to harvest the wood? And I think we were even less because it was just down by Oregon. So it was like, you find somebody to harvest the wood and then you find somebody to manufacture it and to bring it up here and to install it. And it's like that whole process and thinking about that. And I think the reason we were successful on this project is because we had such amazing team and we had experts from multiple architects, multiple contractors, multiple different, you know, landscape designers too. So we could pull the experts that we had and they, you know, each of them had a little bit different expertise and they would go talk to somebody else, maybe not even on this project. And so the group think that we had really made a big difference, but that helped us, you know, kind of drive what we could do and be most impactful. Anybody else like to add anything to that? Thinking about that that collaboration across partners who have deep expertise and relationships. It, it sounds like relationships with contractors and subcontractors and suppliers were so critical to making this project a reality. Definitely. Um, do you want to add anything from your point of view? Well, I'd just like to say, I, I think that the, the entire sort of dynamic that was started um, by Microsoft from the beginning, that it was one overall campus and a team effort by, you know, we were typically competitors, but we all worked together and, you know, we had ran into the same, some of the same problems and we bounced things off of each other and it had very open communication. And I think that that really facilitated a successful project, um, you know, from our perspective and, you know, from Microsoft's as well. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It definitely was a, a large team, five architects and designers, three GCs, <laughs> two landscape designers, and then all the other hundreds of people it takes to pull something like that off. So it was really, I think, a unique um, case in that we had all these competitors working together, but it felt like we all really understood this vision and it was great to see that we were able to, to uh, collaborate and get there and a lot of learnings obviously along the way, which is great for all of us. No doubt, yeah, thank you for sharing with sharing those learnings with us. I wanna hold up a comment in the chat thanking Microsoft for your commitment and noting that 50% FSC would is, is amazing. And I'm sure it took a lot of effort uh, wearing my FSC US board member hat. I appreciate the commitment to seeking out and, and finding FSC would too. Um, which links to a question we have from the audience of what would help private companies find suppliers or source climate smart materials more easily and at a lower cost? Does anybody want to answer this or need to take this one too? Um, I think just we rely on, you know, the industry experts and academics like the Carbon Leadership Forum, CART, Climate Smart Wood, Sustainable Northwest, and EcoTrust. And we found different research about FSC. And, and I feel like now it's like very generally recognized and industry standard. And so I think we have to rely on the facts, but at the same time, like we're just a small team. Like Microsoft is just a small team. Like we have to rely on the people that we hire and people like Angie, who's, you know, like an expert in sustainability for a contractor, like 
they they're going to be able to get so much deeper and be able to talk to people and find out what's going on. Um, but it's just, I think it's just incredibly important to have like standardization mechanisms like within the industry to assess because we can't always go out there and figure everything out. But like if there's a benchmark and, and you can show, you know, like what you're doing and how it's providing the best product or the most sustainable product for us, like we want to invest in that and we want to help partner with people, you know, like there were even discussions about talking to mills about like, how can we help them get their FSC certification? Or is there, you know, like we are buying a certain quantity. If there's a certain quantity that we're buying, if they are practicing FSC, you know, like basically acting as if they're doing FSC, but they don't have the physical certification. Like if we buy a certain amount, does that help them be able to justify that? And then I think, you know, like just relying on our architects, our engineers, our contractors, like they are the industry experts. They work with lots of teams and we have to trust what they tell us. So we are definitely not the experts in this, but we try to get as many people to help us as we can. One thing to add to that too, I think EPDs is really important. So for any material or sustainable material, the way that we're tracking it on projects is we are architects and our DCs and our consultants are constantly looking at for materials that we can, you know, apply in certain circumstances. And with the, the really the key is embodied carbon certifications. But the way that we do that is like looking through EC3 and looking through other LCA tools. And so we need EPDs for your products to be published so that we can basically recognize the benefits of your projects and then that we can select those and, and it will be a lower embodied carbon product for us. Thanks for speaking to EPDs, Evan. You provided the perfect segue into my next question. Um, we, we talk a lot about EPDs over here at Washington Conservation Action and how important they are in projects like this. Um, I know there's varying levels of detail or kind of specificity in EPDs, which is one challenge we often run into. Um, so I'm curious, whether it's related to EPDs or other aspects, what additional information from suppliers or additional kind of scientific information or analysis would help improve Microsoft's kind of procurement decision making, whether that's around carbon or other other factors? I think I can start and then I love Angie Way, but I think any EPD is better than no EPD. So start at a really high level, and I think that's that's helpful but getting it down to like a more granular le level to like the specific manufacturing location and kind of where your, your products are actually from, I think is really important. So the, the, the more granular and the better your EPD can be, the more real the data is and the, the more useful it'll be to us. So I think that's kind of one really key thing. And then just also just continuing to kind of publish information and make it known about kind of the things that you're doing outside of just like the product itself, I think is really important. So trying to decarbonize the whole the whole kind of effort in industry is really key as well. Yeah, for sure. And I guess we should say, I forget if you said the full term, EPD is Environmental Product Declaration, um, which provides kind of verified third-party information about a product, including global warming potential, um, critically in this conversation. I think something also, it's important to talking about overall procurement, getting it in the specs. I mean, that's from a contractor perspective. If it's not in the specifications, it's hard Force, it's harder for us to get that information from the suppliers. And on this project, you know, the, because everyone was engaged so early, we were able to develop a solid set of specifications, which really facilitated, um, you know, the implementation throughout construction and throughout procurement. When we were trying to decide between um, different products, we were able to go back to it and say, no, no, we have, we must have this, um, you know, product specific EPD and we can now put it into EC3 and we know our you know, body carbon is accurate. Um, so everything was playing its part throughout the process. Anyone else wanna jump in there before we ask maybe one or two more questions and close out? Okay, um, we've, we've got a couple of uh, questions from Aaron Everett in the chat, the director of the Climate Smart Wood Group um, around uh, Microsoft's plans for a portfolio level look at the at the wide world of climate smart wood possibilities, um, and then discussions about a, a purchasing commitment. And Aaron wanted to know what would the contours of something like 
a purchasing commitment um, look like for to be viable and successful at Microsoft, acknowledging the kind of specific constraints and, and world in which you operate as a company? Um, I, I think that I, I'm not exactly sure. We might have to get back to you on that one because I feel like a lot of times we have to, like, we don't claim to be experts on any of this or get, you know, like we focus on our partners to be the experts for us. So we would be more likely like bulk buy for like a big project or for a certain number of years. And Potentially we would do that, but it would be taken on by our, our teams to support us. Completely fair. That's a hard question to answer on the spot. We got one specific one from um, uh, Ed uh, Stiskel. Uh, were vegetation rooftop con rooftops considered on campus buildings uh, in this project? So we do have uh, a percentage of our roofs are vegetated and it's, our goal was 5% and we hit over that, but we actually, there was like a lot of factors. This was actually one of those things where it was like really hard. It was like, okay, what do we do with our roofs? Like first you have to be like, okay, we got to figure out where to put all our like mechanical equipment. And that actually takes up a big chunk. And then if you have a small percentage that's vegetated, then it's like, okay, we're talking about lead and we're talking about like reflectivity on the roofs and what our, you know, heat gain is. And then we talk about solar powers, solar panels. And so we originally talked about wanting to put solar panels on our buildings and they are solar panel ready. But since right now we have a purchasing contract for renewable energy, we felt that we could put our funds other ways. So that's why we didn't end up with fully green roofs because we thought maybe in the future we would use that for PV. That makes yeah. sense. Mm -hmm. And then just adding that, so I think we did a lot. I think there's a lot of different things about roofs. We're trying to collect water from the roofs as much as possible. Yeah. You can't reuse water that comes from uh, kind of the green roof area in the city of Redmond. You have to treat it very specifically to remove the phosphorus. And so there's kind of like the battle. So we did do a pretty extensive green roofs in this campus. Silicon Valley is a mostly green a huge, huge effort there. And then here kind of weighing the impact between having your mechanical screening, having like the roof area specified for water collection and then having green roof, it kind of was all a balance. Yeah. But in both campuses, we do have vegetated roofs. I think it kind of goes back to like, what's our number one focus and what we really wanted to focus on this project was the carbon. That was like, like we had to have a number one priority and yes, we want to do everything, but at some point we have to, we have to kind of rank those things. Absolutely. Um, and if you have to prioritize a factor, carbon is a, is a good one. Um, I, I've already pushed our conversation to five minutes longer than I was supposed to, because I was so enjoying the Q and A with you all, but I think we should wrap up now with um, a really uh, a lot of gratitude for taking the time to present and share the project with us to all four of you. It's been really interesting to learn more about it. Um, so thank you very much to the audience. We're going to have a five minute break and we'll see you back at 4.05 for our final presentation of the day. Thanks so much. Thank you.